Hello, everyone. We'll just give people a, about 30 seconds to join before we begin. People hopping on. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the webinar. Thank you for being on. I'm Mandy Sankuler, and we are joined this evening uh, by Dr. Cheval Kapadia, and he's going to speak to us about genetics and cardiomyopathy. Just a few things, some housekeeping items to make the presentation more enjoyable. All attendees are in listen only mode. You will be able to type your questions into the Q&A box though, and there will be plenty of time at the end of the session uh, for us to answer those questions. Please note that questions about your specific condition or your treatment cannot be answered on this webinar, but we do encourage you to consult with your own healthcare team if you have questions that come up as a result of listening tonight. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website and on our YouTube channel. And now to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kapadia is located in Richmond where he's a cardiologist with the James River Cardiology Practice. He's practiced there for over 25 years. He's passionate about early detection and prevention of cardiovascular disease and chronic heart failure. Dr. Kapadia received his degree from the University of Virginia and then completed his residency in internal medicine at the Medical College of Virginia in Richmond. He went on to complete a fellowship in cardiology at Brown University at Rhode Island Hospital in Providence, and he's board certified by the American Board of Cardiovascular Disease. Dr. Kapadia is a community leader and professional resource in the fields of cardiac wellness and disease prevention. He's been providing cardiology care to patients in Richmond for over 20 years. And during that time, he's given numerous talks and seminars to his fellow physicians and to the community. He's been voted top doc in Richmond Magazine multiple times by his peers, and he's committed to treating the whole patient, body, mind, and spirit. So we are indeed lucky to have him. And finally, before I let Dr. Kapadia take over, just to remind those of you who are not members, you can join Mended Hearts, Young Mended Hearts, or Mended Little Hearts on our website at mendedhearts.org. We have many membership levels and it starts at zero. So I'm gonna stop share now. And Dr. Kapadi, I'm gonna let you share your screen and get started. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Perfect. All right, well, Mandy, thank you so much. And the rest of the Mended Hearts team, uh, thank you for inviting me uh, for this talk and um, thank you for the introduction. So. I look forward uh, over the next, you know, 30, 40 minutes uh, to, to talk to you guys about uh, genetics and cardiomyopathy. And I know you are uh, a fairly sophisticated group of uh, consumers, patients, uh, caregivers. And so um, uh, I hope I don't uh, dumb it down too much at all, but, uh, uh, but I hope to cover a lot of stuff. And some of the stuff you might already know and some of the stuff you may not know. And uh, I look forward to it and then look forward to the Q&A at the end. So we're going to talk about genetics and cardiomyopathy. And cardiomyopathy uh, is, a, is a big topic, right? And so if we think about cardiomyopathy, and it's a, it's, it's a big word, it's, also, it's, also, it's a better term than heart failure. And, and when I talk to patients every day about heart failure, I kind of cringe because it just, it just sounds bad. Right. Uh, but it, there's a whole spectrum of it and it doesn't necessarily mean things are failing as, as, as the word would imply. So cardiomyopathy is really a heart muscle disorder and has a variety of different causes. And you can, you can kind of think about it from the perspective of what could happen to the heart. So the heart is a muscle, uh, and in its simplest way, it's a pump with its own plumbing and electrical system. And the, the pump, you know, um, is a muscle itself, and it's the only muscle that beats 24-7, uh, and uh, it requires a lot of energy. So things that can go wrong. 
right? The heart can thicken abnormally. Uh, we know in the setting of high blood pressure, the excessive high blood pressure, the heart can thicken and that can be adaptive, but can lead to problems with uh, a stiff heart long-term. And we call that HEF-PEF or heart failure preserved ejection fraction. Uh, but there are also abnormal uh, genetic causes of thickening of the heart, which we actually, as a case sort of study, we'll, we'll talk about today. Uh, the heart can thicken, uh, can also stiffen, right? So it can, uh, there can be other things that can cause the heart to, 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 fit, to pump properly, uh, but not, not relax properly. So remember, in the cardiac cycle, there, there are two parts of the cardiac cycle. There's systole and there's diastole. And systole is when the heart squeezes out blood uh, through the aorta to the, to the vital organs. And you know that number of the efficiency of the heart is anywhere from 55 to 70%. Um, and that's called the ejection fraction. But, the prob but then there's another part of the cardiac cycle called, called diastole. And that also requires energy. And that is to relax the heart so it can receive blood from the lung full of oxygenated blood for the next uh, output. So when you the heart doesn't relax properly, that can also cause congestive heart failure. The other area is when the heart becomes enlarged and uh, thins out, and that's called dilated cardiomyopathy. And that can be caused by uh, the most common cause in the United States is high blood pressure, diabetes, and, and coronary artery disease, heart attacks. But there are a host of other causes that can do that, viruses and genetic and whatnot. We won't talk about that today. And then there's, there's another uh, category that's called infiltrative, where the heart muscle can be replaced or um, can get infiltrated with other kinds of substances that cause the, the, the pump to, to not work as efficiently. So we're gonna talk about two cases today or two conditions rather, not cases. One is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the other one is amyloidosis. So a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a condition with thickening of the heart and amyloid is where it fills with abnormal substances. And the reason I've picked them is that there's interesting genetics around that. And I know that you all are interested in not only the testing of the patient that has the condition, but also how do we screen family members? So this probably is something that you all are familiar with, the symptoms of congestive heart failure. So regardless of the cause, the final common pathway uh, and symptom status is, is very similar regardless of the cause. People develop shortness of breath uh, from cardiomyopathy that leads to heart failure. They can get fatigued. They can get swelling in the ankles and legs. They can develop electrical problems, uh, particularly things like AFib, PVCs, VTAC. Uh, that can cause that can uh, cause trouble, and of course syncope, which is passing out um, suddenly and loss of consciousness. So these are the myriad types of symptoms that patients can can uh, have in this condition. So genetics one hundred and one. You know, not knowing how much you understand about genetics, and you know, genetics has evolved since I was in medical school and in training it's come uh, incredibly fast. And now, you know, we can map the whole human genome. And so we've learned a lot, but there's still so much that we don't know, right? There's many diseases are single gene, gene mutations or a chromosome deletion or an ab So things like Down syndrome, which is a chromosomal aberration to cystic fibrosis or Huntington's disease, which is a single disease, single gene aberration to many diseases that are multiple genes. So it's pretty complicated. Uh, but the good news is that just because you have a genetic abnormality doesn't mean that's the end all and be all, right? How that gene expresses itself can be modulated by many, many things, you know, diet, lifestyle, environment, medications. So we're learning a lot about the field of epigenetics and the expression of, of genes. To give you kind of, there are three kind of bullet points here about genetics. One is the inheritance pattern, right? So uh, many, many of these conditions, uh, the two that we'll talk about are inherited from one member of the family to the next through a process called autosomal dominance or, or recessive genes, right? So if you have a parent with a abnormal gene and uh, a parent with a normal gene, 
and depending on the condition. So if it's autosomal dominant, that means that the, the child could have uh, two abnormal genes, one abnormal gene and one normal gene. And depending on the condition, uh, if even if you have one abnormal gene, the disease could express itself uh, in life as, as some sort of disease state. Uh, autosomal, then that's called autosomal dominance. And, and you have as a child of a 50% chance of uh, you know, having that condition. Autosomal recessive is that if both parents have the disease gene and the child gets it. So that's a lot less common, but does happen. The two conditions we're gonna talk about today are both autosomal dominant. The next thing is pathogenicity, right? So just because you have the, uh, the gene, does it necessarily translate to uh, a disease state or a disease condition? And so when we do genetic testing, you, you might run into these terms. If you ever get gene testing, talk to a genetic counselor or your physician, whether a gene is pathogenic, meaning it's directly gonna cause, and we know for sure there's a one-to-one -one correlation between the gene and the expression of the disease, likely pathogenic, uh, if it's likely benign or benign, and then there's this middle sort of gray category, which is a big gray category called variants of uncertain or unknown significance or VUS. And, you know, we're, we're mapping the gene, but the problem is we don't know for sure if that gene or that set of genes uh, is going to necessarily result in disease later in life. Um, and that kind of gets us to genotype versus phenotype. So the genotype is sort of what your your genetic blueprint is, right? What your DNA is. But the phenotype is really the expression of that condition in a given person, right? So do you have, you have the gene for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but is it really gonna express itself as thickening of the heart, you know, what have you in, in the person that has that? And there's two terms that are really important to, to know. One is penetrance and one is expressivity. So penetrance refers to if a gene, what percentage of patients with a certain, certain gene are going to have that condition, you know, expressed clinically, right? And that's called the penetrance. Um, and different, different gene, disease states and gene types result in variable penetrance. And then there's another term called expressivity. So just because you have a gene and it shows up in, in some sort of testing that you do that you have it, how severe is that condition? That's probably the best way to, to, to relay it. Is, it. is it a mild form? Is it a severe form? If you take cystic fibrosis, you know, do you have the full-on respiratory problem or do you have a subset of some other problem, of a problem that cystic fibrosis patients have but you don't have the whole condition and that refers to expressivity. So you know, that's, that's kind of the lay of the land in terms of genetics. And we'll, we'll dive deeper uh, as things go on here. So the first condition we're gonna talk about is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or HCM. And this is basically, the definition is abnormal thickening of the heart muscle, um, significantly thicker than we would expect for conditions uh, um, related to high blood pressure. And it's a pretty uncommon problem but, you know, is that we're testing folks today that the actual prevalence or incidence of these disease states is increasing as we as our testing increases, right? And we're testing people earlier in life and we're finding the condition. So this is a very moving target. So it is still relatively uncommon, but uh, we're finding more cases because of, of genetics. And so this is a problem really of a genetic mutation involving the sarcomere. So the sarcomere is really the muscle unit of the heart. And it, it's very complicated. It, different proteins cause the heart muscle to relax and contract and do what it needs to do, you know, 24 um, seven and, 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 and squeeze the heart. So there's a whole host of problems that could go wrong, that go wrong in certain peoples with these genetic mutations. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy kind of has two faces. One is the heart is thickened uniformly, 
and the heart squeezes fine and um, but may have problems with relaxation. There's another variant of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and that is when it's associated with what we call left ventricular outflow obstruction. So the heart, the heart as an ellipse, uh, there's the apex, which is the tip of the heart and the base of the heart right before it ejects blood through the aortic valve out through the aorta uh, that area is called the septum, and that can be abnormally thickened. And when the heart squeezes, it actually creates obstruction to flow. So the blood actually has trouble getting out through the heart. And it's not due to a valve problem, but it's due to a problem right below the valve. And that's called LVOT obstruction or left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. And that can cause symptoms like shortness of breath. It can cause heart rhythm problems, and it can call PP, cause people to pass out. Um, so. How do patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy present? Well, this is a tough one. You know, there's, there's a whole spectrum of this. And what we worry about is that, you know, in young people, this can present with no symptoms until something bad happens. And you, you've seen athletes, elite athletes, high school athletes suddenly pass out on the basketball court, uh, on the football field. And either they just pass out or they have a cardiac arrest. And that's the first time we uncover this, this type of problem. Fortunately, in professional athletes, we're able to screen folks uh, earlier in the course. But this is still a problem with high school uh, athletes and college athletes where we may not be doing a lot of screening. So the first, the one presentation in this case could be sudden cardiac death, right? And, and that's a terrible thing. And so we want to try to figure out who's at risk and how to, how to, how to, manage this problem. The other way this can present is later in life as congestive heart failure, shortness of breath, chest pain, and electrical problems. So it's a serious condition. Fortunately, it's not a common condition. And the prognosis of this condition is really kind of bimodal, meaning if it presents early in life and we diagnose it, uh, and there's criteria that we can use to risk stratify uh, in terms of uh, sudden cardiac death or other bad things happening. If it presents early in life, the prognosis can be really variable, but it's concerning. But if somehow it's detected later in life, like 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, then the course is, is relatively benign. But, you know, it's really important when you do diagnose somebody in the family that, and that's where we'll get to in terms of genetic testing, is try to figure out are there other people at risk with this condition. So as we talked about in the early genetics piece, this is an autosomal dominant condition. So uh, only one parent has to have the abnormal gene uh, to pass it down. And there's a 50% chance that the uh, offspring uh, will, 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 will have this condition. But it's very variable into, in terms of penetrance and expressivity as we talked about. And so, um, it's a challenging thing to kind of sort out. And I'll, I'll kind of walk through the, the, the pathway of how we think about this. So genetic testing is often limited by the fact that only 50% of patients have an identifiable mutation. And even if you have the mutation, doesn't mean that the genotype equals the phenotype, that the expression of the disease is necessarily going to happen. Uh, and a lot of people have these variants of uncertain significance. So having said that, I still am a big proponent of genetic testing, and let's let's walk through this. So this is a slide that kind of explains the the complexity. So this is the, the this is the muscle unit, the myocyte, and uh, all the things that are expressed here uh, in the top left: the myosin 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 binding protein, uh, troponin. So you can think about the muscle as having thin filaments thick filaments, and other, other components. And these are the, all the areas where abnormalities can happen in terms of genetics. So don't expect you to memorize this, but it gives you some highlight of, of the complexity of, of, of what's going on. So there are about eight, there are many, many genes that cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that we're finding, right? But there's eight top genes that we know can cause conditions um, and the two ones that are bolded, uh, cardiac myosin binding protein C and beta myosin heavy chain, 
are probably the predominant ones, but then there's a whole host of others. And the challenge is, is that just because you have any of these, uh, so uh, doesn't mean necessarily if you're testing family members that they're going to develop the condition, but you know, it, it's something that requires ongoing screening. So there are platforms, and I'll go through that in a bit, that you're asking, well, how do I test these genes? And the good news is that genetic testing has become much more accessible on a direct-to-consumer basis or, th or through a physician, and it's cheaper, it's faster, uh, uh, and better quality than ever before. And we can use various specimens to test for this. You can use the blood. Uh, you can use a buccal swab. So buccal refers to the cheek. So you can take a, a Q-tip and, and get cells off your cheek inside, or you can use even saliva. And, you know, the purest form is to get blood because there's no contamination. But the technology is such now that you can really get very good information from, you know, from the cheek swab or saliva. And um, I've highlighted links to two different companies that do this kind of testing, Invitae and Ambry. Um, not endorsing necessarily either one, but uh, both are good and uh, uh, have used both of them to, to, to manage these patients. So, you know, most of these tests are often covered by insurance. And sometimes if, you, if the patient gets tested, then some of the family members can get, and it's positive, some of the family members can be tested, you know, for free in, in, by these companies, which is actually a really good feature. And these companies then pair their reports with access to a genetic counselor. And that is super important because the complexity of what you might find is, here's the deal, is that, you know, you get a test, right? If, when we get normal blood tests, there's a certain amount of anxiety. There's lots of tests. You see your physician, you go over the labs. But there's a whole nother level of anxiety potentially associated with genetic testing. Why? Because, you know, there's a lot more uncertainty. What does this mean? Am I going to get the disease? How do I monitor for this? You know, what do we do? And so pairing that testing with a genetic counseling session is, is super important. And both companies provide access to that. So I think, I think uh, that's an important thing. I'm going to walk through sort of a cascade or uh, of would go about, you know, uh, testing these folks. And, you know, depending on which cardiac society or literature you read uh, of how to do this, I'll kind of tell you what my thought process is around this. So let's say one of you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you're diagnosed, right? You're called the proband. That's a technical term, P-R-O-B-A-N-D, proband. So proband is the index case. So from there, once you've made the diagnosis of that, and usually it's by echocardiogram, it might require a cardiac MRI to do further testing to sort that out. Then the question is, okay, doc, should I do genetic testing? And I think it's quite reasonable for the reasons I explained. Okay, so let's say we find a, a mutation like the top two, one of the top two ones in the previous list. And you come back with the idea that this is pathogenic or likely pathogenic. It's likely the cause of, of your cardiomyopathy. So at that point, it makes sense to, to look at your first degree relatives. So let's talk about first degree relatives. What does that mean? You know, whenever we take family history, it's not your second cousin removed or your great uncle. It's really about, if you're the patient, it's about your parents, that's a first degree relative, and your siblings, uh, that's a first degree relative, or it's your children, those are first degree relatives. So that's the definition of that. And that's really, you can expand the loop and the circle wider once you get more information, but that's kind of where you, what you want to think about, right? So what I do, if I have a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I do the genetic testing, we have some mutation that we understand. Then the next step is for me to, uh, it may not be as important to go upstream to the parents, but going downstream to the children, I think is really important. So First step is they come in, uh, I would advise they get an EKG, get an echocardiogram, and I would go ahead and get the genetic testing as well, right? So if you've identified a gene mutation, it makes sense that it's something that is likely pathogenic, then go ahead and do the gene testing, you know, for, for those uh, 
people as well and see where that shows up. So between the EKG, the echo and the gene, you have a real sense of whether someone has the, has the genotype, number one, and do they have the phenotype, number two. And if they don't have either, then you know the coast is clear and you can counsel them uh, in a favorable way. Um, if you get some of these other things, so if you get no, if, if the family, if, if, if the pro band, the patient has no obvious gene mutations, then I think, you know, at that point, you're kind of stuck on the genetic part of it, but I still would do the EKG and the echo on the first degree relatives. And if there's no evidence of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy based on those assessments, then I think the coast is clear until we have more data to understand the science, right? So this is evolving. So what might be true in 2023, almost 2024, you know, will change over time inevitably. So you've got to pay attention to this field. And even the folks that have in the middle category, the variants of unknown significance, right? These are uh, gene abnormalities, but it's not clear that it's associated with some uh, uh, pathologic uh, heart issue. Pay attention to that over time, because as, as that testing evolves and gets more sophisticated, that may translate into something that's more definitive, right? So um, that's my approach. So bottom line, proband with the disease, I mean, test the first degree relatives with echo, EKG, genetic testing, and then the rest will flow after that. So that's kind of how I think about that. And I think it's really important from your perspective as advocates of your own advocates of your own health to really push the issue, right? Most physicians are may or may not understand genetic testing from a cardiology perspective. And I think there's just because you go to a cardiologist doesn't mean they understand all of this in that way. And I would push for one of two things. I would push to go to a center of excellence that has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy folks, fortunately in Richmond, you know, I mean, in my practice, I understand it, but we're not a center of excellence. And so then I, if there's something that's more concerning, I'll, I'll refer them to the academic centers and we have UVA and, and VCU, you know, uh, fairly close by, but wherever you guys are uh, in your locality, think about that, right? So don't just stop to say, oh, don't need testing, you know, push your case. I think that's really, really important. So it's important to be um, your own advocates in this situation. Um, this is just to kind of lay, like, how do you decide? And this is where the anxiety comes in, right? You, you might, as a family member, you get tested and you have the gene, but your echocardiogram is completely normal. You might even have a cardiac MRI to look for any additional thickening because it's just a more comprehensive test, but there's no evidence, right? So you test periodically, you do an echocardiogram, maybe three or four years, and it all depends on the age, right? And so you ask me, okay, well, what age should I test my children? Uh, if I have the condition, I would say, based on what I understand, probably no earlier than 10 or 12 years of age would I start testing. And then periodically, every three to five years, you know, do some test like an echo or, um, or an echo EKG or, and or an echocardiogram to look and see if, if the condition is changing over time, if there's any symptoms, because they may have the gene, but it may not have expressed itself uh, at that point in time. And so, and it may never. So we have to know that there's no clear linear correlation between genotype and phenotype in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So I'm sure there'll be questions later, but uh, uh, I'll just kind of frame it in that way. So let's look at another uh, cause uh, of cardiomyopathy is restrictive. And this is where you actually fill the heart with substances that aren't normally there. And there are three top ones. There are many of these, sarcoidosis, hemochromatosis, and amyloid doses. And sarcoid is a, is a condition uh, often seen in African-American uh, patients that is systemic, meaning it can affect multiple organs, the liver, the lungs, uh, and the heart. And they cause these little granulomas or these uh, uh, foci of cells that build up in different parts and can cause problems. 
Um, so sarcoid is, a, is an important condition. Hemochromatosis is a condition of iron overload. So um, you've got too much iron and, and typically it's a problem with the liver and the liver gets affected and the heart can affect it in this way. The good news is you can do chelation therapy, get rid of the extra iron uh, to kind of treat this condition. And finally, the condition we're gonna talk about is amyloidosis, which uh, is, we thought to be a rare condition, but, uh, and it's still fairly rare, uh, but there's a whole spectrum here. And again, as we start to test folks, we realize that these diseases are looking uh, more often than we th are thinking. So what is cardiac amyloidosis? It sounds like a, it's a mouthful, right? So amyloid is a protein that uh, it's an abnormal protein that finds itself in the extracellular space. So it's not a problem of the heart muscle or the heart cells, but it develops in the in-between spaces of the, uh, uh, of the muscle cells in the heart and starts to cause scarring and thickening. And uh, initially the heart function is okay, but it doesn't relax properly. An interesting cardiac amyloid itself is also a multi-system problem. It can affect uh, the GI system, uh, the neuro, it can cause carpal tunnel syndrome, it can cause peripheral neuropathy where you get tingling in your hands and legs. And so it has a lot of manifestations and it, and, uh, it can show up in different ways. One of the things that it shows up is that in, in patients with heart failure, so HEFPEF, that's heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And one of the hallmarks of this is that when you look at the echocardiogram, the ultrasound of the heart, there's a lot of thickening of the heart. But when you look at their EKG, normally in people that have high blood pressure or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, when they have a lot of thickening of the heart, that creates a lot of electrical signal on the EKG. And you can see that. But in these folks where the muscle is actually being replaced or infiltrated by these this other kind of protein, you actually have less voltage on the EKG and it looks, uh, there's a discordance there. So that is a clue. And this is something that you would see somewhere probably in an older patient that has uh, this condition. So how do we classify cardiac amyloid? And um, this is kind of where it gets pretty technical, but uh, not expecting to remember any of this, but just know that amyloid has uh, sort of three different kinds of, um, well, two different kinds of protein issues. Uh, and then there's a genetic and a wild type. So the first is transthyretin amyloidosis. So transthyretin what used to be called pre-albumin. -al pre Albumin is a protein that carries a lot of uh, molecules throughout the, 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 the blood vessels. And transthyretin actually carries thyroid hormone and another hormone from place to place. Something happens with this, with this, uh, this uh, protein that causes it to do weird things. It, it folds in a different way and starts to build up in different organs. So there's two varieties. One is wild type, which is used to be called senile, it, and you just see it in older folks. So, and if we think about dementia, you know, a lot of what we know, what happens in the brain with folks with dementia is amyloid deposition, right? These, these, these strands, these fibrils of amyloid that, that interfere with memory and, and what the brain should be doing. The same thing can happen in the heart. So wild type is something that happens older in life after the age of 60 or 70 years of age. And that's called wild type ATTR amyloidosis. And then there's the hereditary type. Uh, which is HATTR. And this also has um, autosomal dominance inheritance, right? So 50% chance of getting it. There's variable penetrance and there's many, many mutations, more than 120, right? So the prevalence, that means the prevalence means how in the general population, how much cardiac amyloid, this heredity uh, is there out there. And we think it's about 6%. The problem is, is that now that we're doing all this testing, it may be even as high as 10 to 12% in populations with heart failure over the age of uh, 60. And sometimes it is also associated with folks that have a valve abnormality called aortic stenosis, which is one of the heart valves that can get narrowed with time. So all about having 
uh, this in the back of your mind to say, hey, this person, you know, something's not right or they could have amyloid and, and then taking the leap uh, to do a test to sort this out. So it all starts with, you know, sort of being a detective and thinking, okay, there's a chance that there could be some other condition here. And why is this even important, right? Because if you're finding a condition, a genetic condition, you can't do anything about it, that, 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 that poses a challenge. The good news now, and we're not gonna go into therapeutics, but both on the hypertrophic side and on the amyloid side, we have some really good therapeutics, particularly on the amyloid side, which is why there's been a lot of interest. There's, there's ways to treat the amyloid protein and treat, get to the root cause and perhaps reverse or even stabilize the process so that patients who would have other progressed to advanced heart failure and, and died, you know, may have a chance of, uh, of living a better, longer, uh, better quality life. So that's why it's exciting, right? It's uh, with, with pairing the genetic piece of it with the therapeutics. The second is called AL or amyloid light chain amyloidosis. And this is a, a different cause. Um, and the age of onset is much earlier in the 40s. And the treatment of this is very different. It's almost very akin to, if you know the condition, multiple myeloma, it has the same origins. And so if you diagnose someone with AL amyloidosis and the diagnosis is really blood tests and urine tests, uh, to look at certain proteins, then the referral should be to a hematologist, a blood special, a blood specialist, hem a hematologist or oncologist. So hemonc, that would be a cancer or a blood specialist would manage this uh, with different kind of therapeutics. This is a lot rarer than the trans the ATTR, but it is also treatable. So you know, I'll show you the sort of the pathway of how I think about evaluating the patient. You know, going forward, this is a super busy slide but it, it, it helps to kind of sort this out, at least from my perspective. So you have a patient with cardiac amyloid, you're thinking, okay, so I'm gonna test them, what do I do first? Well, the first test is uh, probably not a genetic test right off the bat, but the thing about medicine is that you can either do things sequentially or you can do things all at once. And a lot of times what ends up happening in daily practice is we kind of do things all at once uh, a lot of times. And sometimes sequentially. So the first step is to figure out, do they have AL, AL amyloid? And that's a pretty easy blood urine test. And you can do that. And then you move them on. If, if, if they have it, great. You send them off the hematologist, then you, you can kind of go that way. If they don't, then the next step is to figure out, do they have this ATTR amyloid? And there's a bunch of tests that can have so imaging tests. So it, cardiac MRI, uh, there's a nuclear scan. Um, there are ways to diagnose that, and that raises suspicion. These are not biopsies. These are just imaging tests. And then once you kind of have a high probability is when you do the genetic testing. And the genetic testing is really, really good these days and can help differentiate the wild type versus the hereditary. And so, you know, in my mind, when I see a patient like this, I'm going to go ahead and do the SPEP, UPEP, which is a urinary blood test to look for AL amyloidosis. I'm probably going to send them for an MRI more than likely. And I'm probably going to already, if my suspicion is high enough, uh, go ahead and get the genetic testing because uh, all this stuff takes time, right? And so like, like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there's tons of genes. And we know that um, in this condition, one gene has a high prevalence in African-Americans. Another gene has a higher prevalence in Irish uh, folks and cardiac involvement is much higher in the first column, the one that I pointed the arrow to. Um, and that's the key, right? Because I, as I mentioned before, amyloid can affect not only the heart, but the nerves, the GI tract and lots of different places. So um, having the type of gene will kind of inform you as to you know what, what to think about and how to think about this. Fairly complicated. So here's the genetic testing. So like, like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we have the ability to test the blood, to do saliva and buccal swabs, the cheek. And the same two companies uh, do this very reliably. And the, the nature of the DNA text, uh, testing, you know, is really complicated. It's something called next-gen sequencing, or NGS, lots of different 
testing methodologies to really ensure that you're getting the right data. And of course, as I said, the, the science on this is evolving super fast. Um, super busy here, but I I won't walk through this in, in that way, but this, this gets to the same thing we did with the HCM side is, okay, so now you know the patient has the disease, you've confirmed the genetics, they've got hereditary ATTR amyloid, you've got them on a path, and now they're starting you know, the, the right medication to manage this condition. How do we think about the first degree relatives, right? This is an autosomal dominant condition. So 50% chance of uh, the offspring of having this disease. So I take the same steps as I would uh, with the other group of HCM patients. We'll get the EKG, we'll get the echo, and then go ahead straight to the genetic testing, right? You don't need to do all the other imaging stuff. Uh, that's not necessary at the first at the first blush. And based on those results, then you can uh, uh, get genetic counseling and then get referred out to, to whatever needs to happen. This condition, though, be mindful of, you know, has many faces. It can affect it can affect, uh, you know, the, the, the GI tract, there's neurological tract, uh, there's the nerves. So, you know, it, this, is a, this is a true interdisciplinary uh, disease that requires probably an, a care, an ex, a, a center with that kind of excellence. So in Richmond, Virginia, we have VCU that actually has a cardiac, a cardiac or sarcoid, I mean, sorry, amyloid clinic that's comprised of cardiologists, neurologists, you know, GI specialists and a whole team around managing those patients. So, you know, again, being your own advocate is super important because if you suspect that you have this condition, so the the the, the, the suspicion has got to come from the physician level. But, you know, if you're a patient and you're going through this, you have congestive heart failure, you're in your 60s and you're like, you know, I'm just not getting better. And I, uh, you know, ask the question, right? Like you would be your own advocate. Hey, doc, have you considered uh, amyloid? And I think that's that's pretty sophisticated from a, from a patient perspective, but that's what you guys are. And I think uh, that that's super important. So um, not everyone is informed at the same level, but uh, it really starts with two people in a room, a physician and a patient kind of trying to figure it out. So with that, I'm going to stop. Uh, I went through a lot of material over the past 40 minutes or so and take some questions and comments from the group. So we don't have any questions yet. Um, we do have a comment earlier on. Bonnie said that instead of using the term heart failure, cardiac compromised is such a, a much better term. <laughs> I, I would agree. But yeah. you, you said so many things that really struck a chord. First, you kept you know talking about the importance of being a self-advocate. And I think this is the type of presentation that for all the chapter leaders who are on, this will be on our YouTube channel, and this is exactly the information you need to take back to your fellow members. And you could play this presentation at a chapter meeting because that's really important to get those answers with these rare diseases when you don't, you can't understand what's going on, but to keep asking the question. Um, and then the other thing you talked about was kind of the emotional like and fear that comes up with the genetic counseling. And I don't think people yeah. really talk about that as much. So yeah. thank you for highlighting both of those. Oh, um, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Do we, you must have done such an excellent job of covering <laughs> that topic. I mean, <laughs> either I, I confuse I don't have people questions. immensely. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't have questions because you literally answered every question as we were going through. So I do see, um, James asked, does a, an A-plus test for, is it Loewy's Dietz cause HCM? I don't know what that means. Can you see the chat, doctor? Are you able to? No, you might, I cannot. You can't. So it says, does a, oh, does a positive test. There we go. Does a positive test for Loewy's Dietz, L-O-E-Y-S hyphen D-I-E-T-Z cause HCM? So, uh, you know, not being a genetic expert um, and knowing all these conditions is obviously a very specific thing uh, that I would have to Google, <laughs> and, you know, or look or look at my resources. And so uh, 
I, I, I don't know the answer to that. But uh, if obviously there's a question there, so I'm happy to follow up, but uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, thank you. Um, Catherine asked, did you see after COVID with the vaccine, did you see an increase in teenagers with cardiomyopathy? Ah, uh, no, that's a really good question. And, and the answer is no. Um, I mean, well, the answer is with COVID, there were folks that developed myocarditis and um, across the country. And it's not very clear. And uh, and I will say my niece included in New York had some sort of myocarditis, even though all her markers for testing for COVID were negative. But there were very similar cases that, that, that kids presented really sick and then got better pretty fast with therapies, I mean, within a few weeks. And this pattern was seen all around. I, you know, consulted with various pediatric cardiologists. And so uh, fortunately, it was, a, it, it was a small number, but it was a real number uh, that was puzzling. I mean, kids get myocarditis and different causes and different viruses uh, can cause it. Uh, so fortunately, yeah, there was a small uptick, but um, uh, it's really settled down and I haven't heard any more reports of that. Okay, thanks. Catherine has another great, uh, really good question. Would you advise parents to have a heart screening for their child before they start um, like football or baseball or basketball? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I would say, you know, not uh, at a policy level, if they if they look at it, the United States, like Europe, Italy does, a, I think, a better job of screening folks. And here we we sort of frame it as well. Is it is it cost effective? And 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 I'm not sure I buy into that because these tests are not very expensive. Right. And if you can get a point of care ultrasound, I literally have one where you hook it to your iPhone. You can take a quick picture. It costs nothing. It costs very little. And you can know. And so I would say anyone that plays competitive sports like football, soccer, uh, particularly where there's, you know, forget about the head injury piece of it, but collision and, and all those risks, I would say yes. I mean, and, and it starts by asking a simple, asking, a, get, getting a good history. Is there any family history of anything, right? Doing a good physical exam. Uh, are you having any symptoms, obviously? getting an EKG, and if any of those things lead to any concern, low threshold to do a quick point of care ultrasound, right? Because you'll know right away. If there's an issue, there's an issue, and if there's not, then then you're free and clear. So that would be my sort of unfiltered answer. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Bonnie okay. asks, um, mother and her father both had uh, cardiovascular disease and congested heart failure. Some heart failure might be the result of the chemo, taking chemo. Would genetic testing show results to specific types of cardiomyopathy in the patient who um, resulted in heart failure from chemo? Um, I don't think the answer is known there. I mean, I think there are certain chemotherapeutic therapies that have clear cardiotoxicity, and I don't think it has to do with genetics necessarily. I mean, there may be some that might be vulnerable, but the vast majority. And there's this whole field of cardio-oncology that has evolved to look at this. And so, and as all we've had this whole of chemotherapeutic drugs, I think it's just cardiotoxicity and knowing what drug you're having. And so if you're getting treated at, at a certain center, you know, having that discussion with your oncologist is really important. I don't think genetic testing necessarily is the first line of defense here. Okay. Uh, Catherine just wanted to add on, she's down with our Austin chapter, and she said that the Austin Heart Car Cardiologist practice there, they have complimentary screening for teenagers who are involved in sports. So that's oh, pretty that's great. wonderful. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty great. Um, so I don't see another any other questions. I think we're done. Um, Bill says, in a more general sense, we often see patients with their family. In my case, I have four generations of CAD, grandfather, dad, him, and a daughter. Um, is it good to suggest cardiac screening for the younger ones who may be there during our visits? Yeah, it's a very general question around, uh, I think it's always good to get a 
a good family history and dive deep, right? A lot of the diseases that we see today are diseases of affluence or, or, or abundance, I guess, uh, uh, you know, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, create conditions, obesity that lead to heart disease. But there's obviously a genetic basis to this. And it, it is not as simple as sarcoid, I mean, as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or amyloid. There's not a single gene necessarily, uh, with the exception of uh, another topic that we're going to be talking about is, uh, is people with a familial high cholesterol, right? So in that situation, there are genes that we can test on. So if a family member has CAD and you've tested their cholesterol, is it is it sort of garden variety American sort of uh, high cholesterol, or is it something super high that's out of uh, that's clearly genetically driven? Then that's where I think uh, screening is super helpful in in that situation, and even doing some genetic testing. Yeah, and that leads to a great point. We're going to be back here at the same time next week on Thursday talking about cholesterol and genetics. Um, so the link to the register for that went out in the national news about an hour ago, or you can email the office and we'll send you registration info. It'll be on the website tomorrow as well. But I think that's it for the questions and for the chat, Dr. Capadia. We, I mean, this was excellent and I'm excited to hear what you have to say next week, but you were so thorough. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for inviting me and uh, you all have a good evening. You too. We'll see you all soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.